Well, good test. morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the first session uh, of day two at Soccer X Europe here on the Academy stage. Um, what better way to start day two than to talk about talent and talk about players? Just want to start by referencing something uh, that happened in England uh, last week. Sadly, Berry Football Club, um, some of you may have seen on the news, um, were expelled from the English Football League, uh, a very well established club, uh, due to financial uh, irregularities. They went bust. But what was quite interesting was the academy director, uh, now the former academy director, um, put something out on social media, on Twitter. Uh, and I'll quote him here, oh well, my role as academy manager has now ceased and I'm looking for new opportunities within football. Proven track record in producing players for the first team, 25 in the last five years and generating two and a half million pounds worth of sales with a recruitment budget of only 5,000 pounds. And it really highlighted to me how critical to all clubs from top to the bottom irrelevant of which country, how important nurturing talent and identifying talent is. And today's title, as you can see up on the screen, is the talent creation mix, how to identify and develop better talent. And I'm delighted to be joined on stage um, by a wealth of experience from a range of um, European clubs. Uh, and I'll start at the end. There we have Laura van Leeuwen. There we go. Um, from the Ajax Coaching Academy. Um, she is the coordinator there for the Ajax Coaching Academy, promoted on the screen to manager. She's happy about that. Okay. Next, uh, we have David Fernandez from Econo. Um, he's the director there, but formerly worked at PSG as well. Okay. We have Joe Capetto, uh, Benfica's chief information officer, and lastly, Francisco uh, Tavares from Sporting Lisbon, who's their physical performance coordinator. So thank you very much for joining us this morning um, and great to have two representatives of mm -hmm. two great Portuguese clubs at this inaugural Soccer X Europe in Portugal. So thank you all for joining us. And Laura, um, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. Um, a club with such history uh, of developing and nurturing talent from Burkham to uh, De Jong and De Ligt more recently, how much of this is down to the coaches recruiting the right coaches and not just nurturing the talent of the players, but nurturing the coaches and their abilities? I think it's very important. So what we have at Ajax is the player that's central in his development process. So that means he's always responsible for his own process and the coaches were there to facilitate his development. So that means it's not about the coach, but it's about the player. And um, we need to yeah, help our coaches develop these skills as well, because it's different. A lot of coaches do have a um, background as a player themselves, so they were the central yeah, player in the process, but they're not anymore. So we need to help them develop different skills. So at Ajax now, we have a process in place. Over the last year, we have developed a recruitment uh, process for coaches. Because at this time, it's not only the players that are recruited of the Ajax Academy anymore, but it's also coaches that are being recruited. And that's very positive because that means we deliver quality, but it also means that we need to yeah, replace our own coaches yeah, on a more frequent base than we used to do before. So what we do now is we start at a young age with recruiting talented coaches from an area, um, yeah, in the area of around 60 kilometers from Ajax. Um, we invite them, um, we have them practice with the kids, see what they're capable of. It's not about diploma so much as it's about good mentality, willing to develop, eager to learn. And then we um, assign them as a, um, uh, a volunteer in the academy. So that way they come in the academy, they live and breathe the Ajax DNA. And this is how, yeah, this is, that's the starting point, so to say. So then if we, yeah, both like each other because it's a two-way street, right? We invite them to become an assistant in the academy and then they're gonna be prepared to become a head coach in the academy as 
yeah, as if there's a spot available. Um, if not, what we also encourage them to do is go back to the club they were coming from. Because these clubs are very important for Ajax in the recruitment process of players. So the better the coaches at those clubs, the better the players will be when they come into the Ajax Academy. So this is how the process works nowadays. Then of course we have the content and yeah, we also need to develop the coach. Um, it's not, yeah, if, if they're in, once they're in, uh, we need to develop them. So we also have our methodology. That's one part of developing the coaches. And we have made some clips to yeah, show the Ajax way of thinking, the philosophy, the way of playing, so they get really familiar with Ajax. Because, yeah, we'd like to think we're different than another club, right? Um, so I brought one of these clips. Maybe we can have a look at the first one mm. to give you an idea. The Ajax Coaching Academy wil nationale en internationale clubs, coaches en spelers inspireren door het delen van de Ajax opleidingsvisie. Deze editie bestaat uit twee afleveringen. Jeugdcoach van Ajax, Dave Bos, vertelt aan de hand van wedstrijd en trainingsbeelden van Ajax 1 en zijn elftal onder 17 over een onderdeel uit de speelwijze van Ajax, het lokken van de tegenstander. So what we do is we invite the youth coaches because they work every day with our methodolo methodology. And by the example of Ajax first team, we, yeah, it's like <laughs> onion, bless you. We peel that off to the youth academy. So the second one is an example about, um, yeah, what we do in Ajax with the first team. Eh, zoals ik al vertelde gebruiken wij Ajax 1 echt als inspiratiebron voor onze jeugdopleiding. En in dit filmpje gaan we wat meer in op wat je eigenlijk de voorwaarden die je nodig hebt om uh, goed positiespel te kunnen spelen. Daarbij eh, zie je het hier in beeld ontstaan. Als wij positiespel spelen en richting de ruimte willen spelen en tegenstanders willen lokken om uit te stappen, creëren we eigenlijk altijd een overtal rondom de bal. Hè. Dus in dit geval is dat een 4 tegen 3 hè, met Matthijs de Licht, die is nu aan de bal, dan met Masrui, Akim Sieg en Deli Blind en die spelen eigenlijk daar... In die ruimte een 4 tegen 3. Je zal weer wederom zien dat het gaat om het lokken door middel van een paas. Die paas gaat eigenlijk in de lengteas, dat zie je nu ontstaan. Deze paas wordt gespeeld en dan hebben we eigenlijk die verbindingsspeler nodig om weer terug te komen bij Daily Blind. Nou, dat zie je eigenlijk hier wederom ontstaan. Dus weer diezelfde veldbezetting met iemand aan de bal, iemand rechts van hem, iemand links van hem en iemand in de as. En nu hebben we de verbindingsspeler daar, zodat we komen tot diepte. Nou, en uiteindelijk maken we volgens mij een geweldige goal. Yeah, so this is the great example. I mean, yeah, everybody knows the success of Ajax won over the last year. But then the third one, and it's also really nice to see, is how do we, yeah, train? How do we train these, these qualities you need to perform at the highest level? Vanuit de werkwijze, net hebben we beelden van Ajax 1 gezien. Hoe gaan we dit vertalen richting, uh, richting de trainingen? Hier zie je eigenlijk een wel een wat een complexere vorm. En dat zullen we ook een opbouw in maken van kleinere aantallen naar steeds grotere aantallen. Wat je hier ziet is eigenlijk een 4 tegen 4, een plus 4 neutrale spelers. Waarbij we oranje tegen groen spelen in het midden. En waarbij je eigenlijk vier paarse neutrale spelers hebt die tussen de palen mogen bewegen. De regel van dit spel is dat een paarse niet schuin uh, mag spelen naar een andere paarse, maar wel in lengteas. En dit gaat eigenlijk terug naar richting de voorwaarden waar we het hiervoor over gehad hebben. He, dus de veldbezetting vanuit iemand aan de bal, dat er iemand rechts moet komen, iemand links moet komen en iemand in de as als verbindingsspeler. Nou, hier zie je eigenlijk een lokpaas ontstaan richting het midden. He, en dat is eigenlijk om de tegenstander te lokken richting een bepaalde ruimte. Nou, hier zie je dat een, een speler instapt om druk te geven en dat geeft ons richting en een vrije man uiteindelijk. En dus de man die druk geeft, die ruimte willen we bespelen. Nou, dat zie je hier weer ontstaan. He, hier is de bal centraal en gaan we uiteindelijk naar een veldbezetting. Dat is hier. En hier zie je eigenlijk dat we weer iemand rechts hebben, links hebben. En net zoals we bij AX1 hebben gezien, iemand in de lengteas. En dat moet de derde man de verbindingsspeler zijn naar de vrije man. Nou, dat zie je hier ontstaan. He, weer naar de vrije. En dan spelen we vanuit daar de bal naar de ruimte. En dit volgt zich in elkaar op. He, dus het doel van deze oefening is echt om continu in die veldbezetting te komen, zodat je eigenlijk druk krijgt op de balbezittende speler en door middel van een derde man of een verbindingsspeler de bal naar de ruimte speelt. Hmm. Uh, I think fascinating, really interesting. I was completely engrossed there in the film. And I guess the, the interesting part there is the fact that there's such a focus on, on not just the players, but the development of the coaches. Um, do we think 
um, that this is a, a new thing, as in, or has it been going on for a while? We all are aware of the importance of coach education and the federations having a responsibility for licenses and badges, but do we feel now that more clubs, and Joe, I know you've been at Benfica for a while, but this club focus on developing their own coaches, is this something that now is of utmost importance across all clubs? Well, I would say that um, developing more uh, stuff and having more uh, knowledge inside the club, it's, also, uh, it's always important. Mm. Um, with the growth of the business, with the growth of the opportunities, you have to bring more people, you have to be more, more uh, experienced with it. And I think technology, and we saw a lot of good examples here, it's part of that process. Mm. Um, I would say that uh, data, it's a commodity today. Um, in all business and in building better players, it's no, it's no different. And uh, data is what allows us um, to answer questions yeah. and to evaluate and measure the evolution of the players and the coaches and the technical teams. So if you don't have data, you'll end up with empiric responses and uh, opinions about things. And with data, you do something different. Uh, in our experience, yeah. I was gonna, and we're going to come back later on to discuss yep. more about the data. So I think that's quite interesting now is, is another point that you made, Laura, was around the coaching methodology. And, and David, I want to bring yeah. you in here <coughs> around yeah. the importance of a methodology and if a philosophy. <coughs> if you want, I can, I can say one, one thought about uh, the intervention of Laura. Because it's very important. I think it's very important to think about this idea of uh, develop criteria to select players. On the clubs, we are very used to spend resources and time thinking in the criteria to identify and select the talent in young players, and that's a key point, it's sure it's obvious. But um, clubs, I think that clubs should uh, spend more resources in develop this criteria and all these processes, not only to identify and select, also to develop coaches and evaluate uh, coaches. In often in, in the academies, in the professional academies, there are two, three players, uh, very talented and with a very specific personal profile. And they will be professionals. They will be professionals for sure. They don't need the coaches. But there are a second bigger group of uh, players depending on the academy, 10, 20 players with a certain potential who really need a very specific kind of coaches. If there are not other criteria to select the coaches, often uh, the coaches who promote are the coaches who win more, but not necessarily the coaches who are capable to win more championships are the best coaches to develop talent in one academy. So I think it's a very important point to, to, to focus for the, for the clubs to invest resources in, in identify, select, develop, and evaluate coaches. No, no, and, and that's really interesting. And, and the, obviously now with that focus on developing those players in the academy, there's been two great examples there of a focus on the coach is as important as a focus on the player. And, and now just going on to that concept of, of this methodology, um, aware that obviously you have a background, as in you, you grew up in Barcelona, you moved to Paris, two cities <laughs> renowned with developing talent and, and through your time at PSG and now at Kono, why this focus on the importance of a methodology and a philosophy? And perhaps you could share with us a bit more about um, what Perhaps whether Okono does that, do they share their own method and philosophy, or is it more about advising a club to develop their own methodology and philosophy? Both. Based on, on my experience, mm, more clear is the model in one academy, more clear is the identity in one club, more professional, uh, more players could be professional. So, and to cover this topic, are uh, three aspects that we have to think about. One is strategy. 
The second one is a structure and the third one is processes. In terms of uh, strategy, it's very important to understand that in one academy, in one club, there are a lot of people working. Everybody is, doing, is trying to do his best, their best, but without a clear strategy, maybe there are, you are losing effort. Maybe, maybe there are people doing, pushing in different directions. So if you clarify the strategy, you can create synergies and you can put all the people on the same line and be more effective. To develop your strategy, your identity in the club, each club has to think about a lot of aspects. Weakness, the strong points, the history, the values, the idiosyncrasy, etc. But finally, it's important to arrive to one sentence. Example, mm, will be the club who will play with national players. Okay. Uh, another example, will be the best neighborhood club on the world. Okay. And there is no limit to find the identity, but each club has to find this identity to be effective. The second one are the structures. You have to, once you have a clear strategy, you have to think about your structures. Are your structures properly uh, oriented to develop the goal or not? And what you have inside this uh, inside your, your structure. You have a lot of things. You have facilities, you have technology, you have uh, human researchers, you have uh, a lot of elements. There is one element that I think it should be developed inside the academies, which is the department of methodology. Because this department of uh, methodology will be in charge, will be the responsible to create or develop or accelerate and keep safe this identity, especially when the, when the attacks will arrive to this identity because the attacks will arrive for sure. Inside the Department of Methodology, you will have people who will not be worried about which, is, which was the result of the U17 the last weekend. You will have people that Every training, every match, every day, every lunch, every single moment, they will be focused on help everybody on the club to keep the line, to save this uh, DNA. And for me, that's very important. And when you have the strategy and you have this, the structures, then you have to think about the processes. Inside the department of methodology, you have to consider different uh, processes. One is this criteria to identify the best uh, players and the best coaches for your model. Another one is to develop one training, one planning of uh, contents depending on the age to put the players in one line as the curriculum in the school. Another very important point is the methodology of training. Uh, you have to create one methodology, mixing coaches, sharing trainings, creating situations of co-learning between coaches and players, players and players, etc., to finally achieve one method to train and one method that could, should be useful to achieve your, your identity. You have to develop also one game model, one game model for the whole for the whole club. Here we have been talking before. Here we have often one problem because sometimes we separate the academy from the professional team, and sometimes when sometimes people arrive to the academy saying, "Okay, you have to play like the the professional team." But the next, but maybe in one year, the, the coach in the professional team will change. The new coach will have another idea, another philosophy, and then we have to change the philosophy in the whole club. That's not efficient. So in my opinion, you clubs, you have to select the coaches for the first team, depending on the 
model and the philosophy of the whole club. And finally, to, to finish, I think that uh, from this department you have to develop a, a program uh, to not to talk about uh, values, not to write something in a paper and put it on the wall, talking about rules or whatever. You have to develop one program with uh, groups of work, with uh, regular activities to live the values that you have inside your identity. And that's very important. To, to try to help the clubs to achieve all of that, uh, we use uh, Econometh. Um, and, and David, just on two follow-up questions. As in, a club like Ajax, it seems, has a, has a clear philosophy. In your experience, are some clubs kind of have always had a, a, a methodology and a philosophy, whereas some clubs are sitting there going, we just, we, we're starting with a blank piece of paper. Is that, is that something that you're seeing, that some clubs are literally, you're often surprised, perhaps, by how lack of philosophy and methodology they have? I think that uh, when we explain to the clubs what you can achieve, club from it doesn't matter where, Ajax is one example, because Ajax finally achieves to have a clear identity. So for us, Ajax is uh, something that we use often, not only Ajax, you have other examples of, in Spain, for example, you have uh, Bilbao. Bilbao has a very clear identity. The strategy is clear also, and they are doing a great job. So, yes, uh, when we present uh, services to one club, we use often clubs like Ajax or other who, who are achieved uh, to be clear in, in a strategy, in processes, in model. And does it then flip round as well? When you're talking about recruiting coaches, you need to recruit a coach that will accept that methodology, especially if you're looking towards the higher end of, say, your 18s or your 23s coach. Because if that coach won't accept that methodology or they go, ah, no, we want to change the, metho the methodology, but the club is like, no, we're not changing it. This is us. Does that often then become a conflict? You want the coach, but they won't accept the philosophy. Well, for us, the, the philosophy is also a process where you build together as a team, you build your direction. And sometimes the process is even more important than the end result. Because, it, yeah, so, it's, it's dynamic in a way, but of course, yeah, by recruiting your new coaches, mm. yeah, you need a growth mindset that's flexible in fitting in our philosophy. So, yeah, for us, it's this way. Yeah, I agree about that. And, and is it something that you advise clubs to reevaluate? Perhaps have you had situations where the philosophy isn't working and, and they've had to go, okay, well, look, we've tried this for two or three years. Actually, it's time to revisit our philosophy and perhaps make some changes to it? Yeah, it depends of the people who is managing the club, if they have one attitude of open mind or not. But uh, it happens not only in soccer, in football, it happens in all mm. the whole industries. And I guess, as in, sure, that leads us interesting. We were chatting just there around the stability of Benfica and the longevity of the management. Mm. Um, a clear philosophy, is that something you think Benfica has? And do you think that's kind of aided yeah. their success? And then obviously you've been able to track that through your, through your focus on, on data. I think share with us what a chief information officer is and does and how that has kind of benefited Benfica. Okay, perfect. You actually throw me a little bit of a curveball in the first one because I'm the IT guy in the room, so <laughs> I have, I'm not the more qualified guy to answer methodology, but I would say that, uh, yes, we do have a Benfica methodology. We do have a methodology that comes from the soccer schools and goes all up the ladder. And I think that's really important to have that identity, uh, especially when you're thinking and when you're uh, going through an internationalization plan where you want to expand uh, beyond Portuguese borders, when you open soccer schools all over the world, uh, it's fundamental to have a clear strategy, a clear model, otherwise you'll be just one more soccer school in the world. So uh, this is something that we've been working and, uh, and IT has been helping uh, inside the club 
to build platforms where this methodology and this knowledge can be stored and then demonstrated and evaluated outside of our country. Because again, if you go outside, then the, the main team, the, the, the main technical uh, guys that stay in Portugal are the ones that are in charge of guaranteeing the quality of our methodology in our schools. We want Benfica players, we don't want just players, like you said. As for the strategy, and now picking up with my specific area, um, basically we've started more than 10 years ago uh, when the, the president actually was concerned that the knowledge was not staying inside the club and we were very exposed, like most football clubs are, to the changes in the head coach and in the, in the team that manage the, the professional team. So uh, we started by developing a platform uh, that has an holistic approach to this with the player at the center, the team, and then all the areas where these gentlemen work, either uh, tactical, uh, performance, uh, nutrition, uh, all these areas coming together to the common goal, which is to perfect the player, to help the player, to protect the player. Okay? Um, this also comes uh, where data comes in. So that's what we want to do, to use data, like I said before, to, to answer these questions. But mainly, these tools also help um, the work of these gentlemen. Uh, Ajax made a good presentation with the examples that they showed about the video and the drawings on the video. All these things take lots of time from these uh, people. And technology here is uh, at, the, at the objective of providing better tools for them so they can spend their time in the, their area of expertise and not worried about stopping the video in one frame, drawing a circle, moving one frame, drawing another circle, which was actually how it was done a couple of years ago. So building better tools, helping them to uh, better implement their job, and keeping the knowledge inside the club. Uh, I would say also that in the, um, in the near future, with all the new technologies that we are seeing, uh, with the artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these new buzzwords in this area, we expect these tools to come more perfect and uh, actually to be able to handle more information and to deploy answers quickly. And in this part of the answers, it's also important to mention that we inside Benfica believe that this should be IT working together with the technical teams. So we build pluridisciplinary teams that work together. The tools that we try to develop are simple tools and they are be to be used by the, by the technical team, not by IT, uh, because we actually don't have enough resources to answer to these guys in time. They want things for yesterday, always. The coach always wants answers in the next five minutes. So they must be able to use the tools themselves uh, and they must be able to extract information by themselves. The other thing that's really important also is to build the bridges between these teams. Actually, in Ajax, and I, I was there uh, two years ago, and I've been traveling through Europe, seeing the out other, other clubs work with this. Uh, there's a lot of clubs, and that's not your case, <laughs> there's a lot of clubs that still have a lot of silos in these areas. So nutrition guys don't talk with medical, medical doesn't talk with performance, performance doesn't talk with uh, tactical. We believe that if we're able to break those barriers and if we're able to put them working together and the technology must be used to help in that, they will produce better work and players will be better served with that. And, and that last point there is fascinating because you wouldn't naturally assume the importance of technology for nurturing and developing players. Do you find that some clubs in your travels and your experience are still quite resistant to using technology to help develop players and other clubs are, like yourselves, on the forefront and, and utilizing it a lot more? I would say that uh, every club uses technology, but they use it in a different way. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of clubs that have more uh, capacity in terms of finance that just buy every solution that comes through the, through the door. Uh, and actually that's one of the problems when the, when the head coach changes because he's used to use a specific set of tools, now he came, he wants to use those tools, the ones that the club offer, they are not good, and we try to convince them that it's not like that. We try to convince them that it's important to have uh, a continuous line in the, in the analysis, and that if he breaks that, he won't benefit. 
you have other clubs that are investing heavily in developing their own tools on top of what the, pe the, the, the market has to offer. If we talk about Barcelona, also Ajax, they have their own hubs of innovation. They have their own areas where they are experimenting and building uh, solutions on top of what the market offers. That has always been Benfica way, by the way, uh, basically because we also need, we don't have the money to buy and go after everything. But I think that's one of the things that differentiates clubs, the way they approach technology, but they all use it. And I guess that goes back to the coaching academy where if a coach comes in and he's brilliant on the pitch with the players but has a real lack of understanding on how to use technology, the important technology, it comes back to training of that coach. Absolutely, but it also comes back to yeah, giving the coaches the expertise on the pitch again, which we discussed shortly. Um, yeah, because it takes a lot of effort for a coach to do all these images. So, yeah, I have no addition to that. Yeah. <laughs> and Francisco, yeah. sitting there very patiently, uh, uh, what's quite interesting is we've gone through and we've looked at the importance of coach education, we've looked at the importance of a methodology and a philosophy, the importance of how technology and data all contribute to um, the development of a player and the nurturing of talent. Your area of expertise is more around the physical development and the yep. physical performance of those players. Um, why and how is physical performance so important in developing talent? They go hand in hand, but kind of give us more of an insight into why it is important and how you perhaps do it at Sporting Lisbon. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, from talent, we obviously need to distinguish what is pure talent and what is uh, older biological age. So that's our starting point. Uh, we want to understand if what we so-called uh, talent player is really talented or is it just in not in the same age group. Um, independently of the case, what we try to do in sporting is stimulate the player. Um, if we recognize that he's playing in, in an age group where the competition doesn't offer him a, a stimulus for development, we try to step him up. And uh, when that happens, it's very important for us, it's determined for us to track um, the load that the player is, uh, is offered. And as Laura uh, was saying, to have a philosophy. So if uh, a player moves from the under 15 to under 17 squad, the training philosophy, uh, the speech uh, is aligned um, throughout, throughout the club. So yeah, it's, I think nowadays, uh, and I was talking with, jo with Joao, um, having uh, data is, is very important so we can um, understand that we are offering uh, the right amount of uh, training load or the technical, tactical stimulus and so on, so on. And I know you mentioned that you haven't been at, uh, at Sporting that long, but in your overall um, experience, obviously you must have a lot of experience to, to get that role at, at, at Sporting, is it an area that every club is now focusing on because it is so important in regards not just their talent but their physical performance and the two are linked together yeah 100 percent. i think uh, i came from a different background i came from other sports but um, independently of the w uh, of the sports the players are there to play the sport so we cannot we cannot uh, overimpose things um, just because i'm a physical performance coach doesn't mean that i put the physical performance on top of anything else uh, in this case, playing football. Um, but yes, I, I think, it, and as Juan was saying, we are, um, we are using data and we are providing reports to answer uh, questions that the coaches and the, the, um, the club wants to, to be solved. Uh, and in, in that case, yeah, 100%. And important. that's really interesting. And I guess it's, it's how all these now tie together that you have your coaching academy, your, your met methodology, your philosophy. Um, Dave, just coming back to you, thinking about the physical performance, again, is that something that when you're working with a club and advising a club that some just aren't at the races, just aren't there around um, understanding the importance of certain elements or of developing and nurturing a, a, a talent and players? Yeah, for sure. <coughs> I think that uh, it the development in a, of the physical preparation, all these aspects uh, are fundamental to, to develop players. 
and for and use uh, technology uh, as a tool is also another element that all the professional clubs are considering for me um, the only one thing that we have to uh, we have to think is that when somebody comes we were talking before when somebody comes to offer to one uh, club or whatever explaining that uh, technology is is the coaching solution or uh, the physical development is the coach is the solution to develop uh, talent is when I think that we have a problem mm. because uh, I think that we have to understand all these processes in a very holistic way and each of us has to play his role in in the process and each of us has to understand that we have to work in a complementary way and not trying to fight between us to be the protagonist or something like that. But yes, in the, in the professional clubs and in, in the professional national associations, nowadays um, all of us are using technology and considering uh, the physical aspects as something very, very important. Just um, coming to my Portuguese end here, obviously we've talked a lot about clubs this morning uh, and the methodology and the you know what I mean the, the physical performance and, and data etc around domestic football do you feel that this translates often to your national teams is what the clubs have been doing in Portugal had a direct impact on the success of the national team and similar kind of uh, Ajax is there discussions between the national team philosophies coaching kind of direction and clubs kind of go towards Portugal first yeah is, is there synergy between what the national team is setting out to and what some of the top clubs are 100 percent that's one of the first things that I because I understood but when I first came to sporting that our most talented players are representing the nation uh, which I think is is worldwide um, so one of the first things I did was together with the, with the, the um, performance coordinator of the Portuguese football mm -hmm. Union to understand what they're looking at, how they're tracking things, and how can we, uh, as, a, as providers, because we provide the players for them to have success, um, how can we gather uh, and work together to help them, what type of information they want, and together, uh, Sporting and, and the Portuguese Football Union, we, we got uh, our data that we share uh, from the youth to the female to the main team, um, so, yeah, we share everything and I, I keep con constant dialogue with, uh, with the, the Portuguese football that's union. That's really interesting and perhaps something that is overlooked sometimes about the importance of sharing those yeah. all different areas with the national team. In, 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 and in Holland, in the Netherlands, is that something, is there a link between Ajax and, and the national team? I think there is. I mean, we have had the Dutch football school or the Dutch way of playing football and I mean, yeah, Ajax, of course, is, is one pillar. The, the, the KNVB has another vision on football in a way, but it's an interactive process because the association, they teach our coaches, they instruct them, they get their licenses, C, B, A, Pro. So um, what we'd like to do with this information is we create awareness again with our coaches. So what is interesting and how can you implement it in your daily coaching experience where you become a self-aware coach who can think instead of following orders? Because we, in the end, at Ajax, we have the philosophy that we create players who can make a difference on the highest level. So in order to do that, you need to be aware of a player and you need to think for yourself in a way. And, and with you've often you <coughs> chatted last night about the importance of sharing data and information. Is that something you do? Do you, sh do you share that data with the, with the national team, or do you discuss yeah, it with them? I'll go into that in a minute. Just want to say about what we, what was being said here before. I think it's important to refocus when we talk about these tools and the technology. We tend to 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 step ahead from from the what's important, which is the talent and the player. And I completely agree with you. There are some companies and some solutions that start to think they know the game, they know the solution, because they did a model that demonstrates how the team reacted to the movement and the positioning of the other team, so that will be the holy grail of the next thing. It's not. Actually, technology only helps to highlight things, but 
the game is about the players, it's about the talent. When we're talking about the challenge, uh, um, sharing the information with, with the, our, our selections and, and the other teams, actually that represents a problem. And one of the objectives of this uh, type of forums that I've been attending with other clubs, with Ajax and uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid and so on, is how could we come up with a standard uh, definition, on not only for data but for tools, in order that the sharing is more simple because Befica has their own tools, Ajax has their own tools, all clubs have different tools and even the, 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 the national teams have different tools. So sometimes it's, different, it's uh, difficult to, to correlate those things because there are different approaches mm. and, and we would benefit for a more standard way of doing this. I think as technology is evolving, as all the clubs are using more and more of these solutions, we should and we are able to come up with a few standards that could simplify the work of these guys because they are the ones who have to receive the player in next Monday after he was playing for the national team and now they have to see how he is and how they will be uh, influence the training and the next game that they have to play for their team. So mm. this is a, a bit of a challenge that we still have to, to face. So some of those things perhaps need to come top down rather than being instigated by the clubs. It's something that perhaps could be instigated more by the national teams uh, across Europe, perhaps. I think it has to come from the clubs, exactly, because one of the tendencies that we see in the market is it usually comes from the providers, from the companies that are developing some type of tools. Mm -hmm. Of course, there will be always the ones that will become dominant because they have a better product or a bigger presence in the market, but we shouldn't be hostages of their solutions and the clubs should be able to come up with their own standards that they should follow and not the other way around. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, a really interesting insight into, into how we nurture and develop players. We've got about three and a half minutes left. Um, if there are any questions at the floor, um, if anybody would like to ask anything. Uh, oh, yeah, we got one there. The microphone's going to come around. Hey. Um, just an interesting, you've, you spoke a lot about philosophies within clubs and developing players to those philosophies. Is, is there a danger that you develop players to play for a club and then when, obviously a lot, most of them won't actually make it to, to playing for the first team of that club, the players then go on to play at a lower level and actually they're used to playing out from the back, etc. In, in the triangles that look amazing for Ajax but sometimes actually that doesn't fit when they're playing in the third division somewhere, or are you developing players that can play anywhere? Yeah, but as in, like, just to make sure, just to, to paraphrase your question, are you developing a player to play for your first team in a certain way, or developing a player perhaps to sell? I guess there's a, a thought, I'm not sure who would like to take that question. David, perhaps your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I understand the, the question and it's very interesting, but. In fact, when, when you are thinking in one process of uh, teaching and learning, which is um, our case when we are developing players, finally we have to choose. And in my opinion, uh, the clubs and the clubs has to choose which is their method. Because on the other hand, if we don't choose one method, if we propose to the player in the same club each year something different, finally for the, for the player will be very, very difficult to, add to, to follow the process because each year will be different. So I understand that uh, there is one situation that, that can come, but finally the club, in my opinion, has to choose one line and follow one line. I'd like to add on that, I think, because we follow one philosophy, but um, for example, 77 players of Ajax who graduated the Ajax Youth Academy playing professional leagues worldwide. So I think this is the highest number in Europe. So I think we, the principles which we teach them, it's not about, I need to play out of the back, or, but it's the principles behind why we play this way makes aware players again who can fit in other systems. Of course they need time. So we have now, for example, sold Matthijs de Ligt. He played his first game. Not everybody was that happy at Juventus, but it needs a little bit of time and I'm sure he will make his, um, he will make his debut very well, second round.
hope that answers the question. I saw, are there any more hands? I saw one hand at the front, no. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm sure that the, uh, our panel will be happy to have some informal chats if anybody's got any questions afterwards. But I would just like to thank our whole panel this morning. A, a fascinating insight there into developing and nurturing performance and players and talent. And I think that irrelevant of um, which team you support, um, every football fan and everybody involved is always excited when a, when a young new player emerges from their squad. And I think we all are waiting to see this season again who is going to be the next De Ligt and De Jong. Uh, and, and good luck to you all for the, for the up and coming season. And thank you all for joining us this morning at Soccer X Europe. A round of applause, please. Thank for you. Our thank you. And I think we're just having a, a quick photo of the photographers. Still here? At the front? Oh.